for the past two years. So uh, tell us what's been done in the project, tell us about it, and then hopefully uh, tell us what you found. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thanks to everyone who is watching us today. It's a great pleasure for me to, to present the results of this uh, two years work. So I, I hope you will find it useful also in your, um, your field of work. Let me share the screen. Uh, I will present uh, uh, the presentation. Okay, can you see this? Okay, so ready to go. Uh, so this is, I'm going to, to say a couple of words about the project itself. The project stands for migration and development sharing knowledge between Poland and Norway. And then I will uh, briefly summarize what we found during, throughout the, the period of the research and what are our main observations and, and conclusions and recommendations for the future. So to start with, we need to uh, remind ourselves the context of this whole debate on migration and development nexus. Back in 2015, we all remember the, the massive inflow of irregular migrants coming to Europe, mostly through the Mediterranean Sea, uh, which led eventually to, to, to very significant political crisis in Europe and uh, mi migration management crisis. And from early on, uh, the, the European Union presented the idea that we possibly need to focus more in our response to address the root causes of migration. So the, the push factors, what, what drives people to, to seek better lives elsewhere in, in Europe in particular. So in 2000, already in May 2015, the EU presented the European Agenda on Migration which proposed as one of four pillars that the, the first, well, the most important pillar of this, this response was to, to, to address the root causes of migration. And the EU document understood the, the, the causes of migration as civil wars, climate change, uh, insecurity, unemployment, uh, etc. And it claimed that one of the, the tools that Europe has uh, at its disposal to deal with this challenge was development assistance, external uh, aid that Europe uh, was uh, regarded, regarded as one of the biggest donor of, of development assistance worldwide. So the idea was that we will address these this push factors, these causes what, what, what force people to, to come to Europe irregularly. And this idea was uh, embraced by many European countries uh, including Poland, while others like Norway were more uh, restrained and, and distanced from, from this approach. Nevertheless, this was kind of overarching uh, atmosphere, the attitude in Europe that we <clears throat> possibly may use aid to uh, lessen the pressure on, on Europe in terms of migration. Uh, so we started our project in mid-2019 uh, it lasted for more than two years. This is, uh, as Patricia said, the collaboration, collaborative initiative between the Polish Institute of International Affairs and Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. And this is supported. We got a, a financial support from EA grants and Norway grants. So what we wanted to understand, understand from the onset of the project was whether aid can indeed address uh, root causes of migration and stop, help to stop irregular migrants from coming to, to Europe. And secondly, how this approach, this policy has been implemented in practice of, of foreign policy of analyzed donors. And when this approach, this policy has been quite effective and on the other hand, when it was less successful in obtaining the uh, declared objectives. So, also, we wanted to understand whether this approach can entail some, can bring some risks uh, for the, the developing countries or for Europe itself. And finally, whether we can uh, suggest any ideas how to improve the European response to migration. Uh, so basically, the, the general question was whether uh, more development assistance to developing countries can lead uh, to less migration to Europe. 
So that was the, the, the puzzle that we wanted to, to understand better. Uh, so what about the um, outcomes, the results of the project throughout the last two years, we, uh, we, what we achieved? So back in 2019, we planned uh, quite extensive uh, field research trips to um, eight countries in Africa and in Asia to collect uh, data and bring some new knowledge to, to this debate on migration and development. Unfortunately, then in early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, outbroke and we had to uh, change our plans and, and scale down the level of ambitions of the project. Nevertheless, we, uh, we managed to do a one study a field trip to Bangladesh, to Rohingya refugees in, in Bangladesh, but also we could benefit it from our previous experiences and research in many countries in Africa, including Asia and, and uh, Chad, for example. So uh, as a result, uh, for the last two years, we uh, prepared nine research papers uh, dealing with uh, very diverse subjects and topics, like we analyzed the um, development cooperation policy and migration policy of Poland and Norway. We uh, had a look at the EU response to migration challenges, then we uh, looked uh, in, with more uh, details into the cases of uh, refugees in Bangladesh, in Niger, yeah, in Afghanistan, in Lake Chad, Chad Basin, and in some other African countries. We also organized uh, some nine international seminars and, and conferences dealing with different aspects of migration development nexus, including more recently, we also dealt with uh, such a relevant topics like the impact of COVID-19 pandemic or the developments on the Poland's Belarusian border and new uh, threat of, of hybrid, uh, hybrid war when migration is used as a, as a tool. Uh, so we also organized two study visits uh, to, to, to Norway uh, under the framework of the Midashar project. Uh, and since, and since the, uh, one of the objectives of, of the project was to learn and share uh, knowledge between Poland and Norway on migration and development issues. We, we, we uh, uh, reached out to uh, new partners in, in Norway, including uh, FAFO Institute in Oslo, Center for Peace Studies and at the University of Tromsø, uh, PRIO, Christian Mikkelsen Institute, and, and, and many others in Norway and in Poland. And the final result is this uh, report. Finally, uh, the title is uh, Development Assistance and Root Causes of Migration, a Risky Road to Unsustainable Solutions. Uh, the, the project uh, uh, gives a very comprehensive overview of this uh, debate on migration and development nexus and brings forward major findings of our previous research and and conclusions and recommendations for, for the future. So what are those main findings? Now, first of all, uh, the, the most importantly possibly is uh, that we learn that probably a policy focus on addressing of root causes of migration through development assistance is rather based on false assumptions and is unlikely to bring desired outcomes. Uh, most of existing literature on this, on this subject tells us that when poor countries develop economically, uh, most likely more people will, uh, will be willing to emigrate from these countries rather than, 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 than less. So uh, the, the general uh, relationship uh, is that more economic uh, development can rather increase uh, emigration rates until a country reach a certain level of uh, economic development. Uh, Patrick, so I'm sorry, are you supposed to use your slides? If you're using your slides, we are still seeing the front, uh, the very first one here. Oh, I really? Yeah. Oh my God. I don't think you have uh, moved them. Or if you have moved them, we, uh, it's not we uh, visible on your shared screen. <laughs> Thanks, Morten, for pointing that out. I was thinking if, <laughs> if this is deliberate. So how can I share it better? <laughs> because I, 
my slides are moving. What I oh. see. It's not moving here. What about this? Yep, it is. Yeah. Okay, so you missed already this, this slide <laughs> and this one and research questions and deliverables. Sorry for this. Sorry you haven't informed me before. But nevertheless, we, we are at the most important part of the presentation. So uh, we are talking about the findings from, from the report. So first of all, uh, I was talking about this, this uh, basically false assumption on which this approach is uh, based. Uh, but uh, more recently, there were new uh, studies showing or questioning this so-called migration harm and, and showing that also in some instances, more development can actually decrease migration to OECD countries. But even these studies showed that uh, economic growth, uh, economic level of development, it's not the only factor that push people uh, to, to seek better lives abroad. Uh, we need to, to, to take into account some political factors and, and so, 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 uh, psychological, social, and, and many other issues that, that um, decide whether one person decides to emigrate or not. Uh, and also we, we realize that um, therefore aid is probably not the best to, to address the causes of, of voluntary and forced migration. Uh, since most of this crisis and, and situations needs political solution or maybe improved security in the first place and, and aid can play rather supplementary and supportive role in these cases. Then uh, what was interesting, we, we, we also uh, found little evidence that this new rhetoric uh, and commitment to address root causes of migration uh, it has not led to substantial changes in development cooperation policies of, of analyzed donors. Uh, so it has not boosted the level of financing for, for foreign assistance, nor it uh, shaped uh, reallocation of funds and, and new prior geographical priorities. Uh, obviously, the EU has in, uh, increased the level of, of financing for development assistance in 2016 uh, especially, but this increase was not that remarkable to have an impact on the ground in, in uh, Middle Eastern or Northern African countries. Poland, uh, on, on, on the other hand, uh, remained as, uh, uh, Polish aid remained uh, at the very low levels comparing to other European donors. And Norway continued as very generous donor, regardless of the differences in its approach to uh, root causes of, of migration. So this approach has not changed substantially uh, the level of financing and directions of EU or European development assistance. This is not to say, however, that aid was irrelevant or, or it has played no role in uh, uh, decreasing numbers of, of irregular migration to Europe we observed in the last five years. Uh, it did play a role, but rather limited and, and supportive. And if that played a major role, it was because it was part of the externalization of migration policy and border controls in third countries. That was uh, the policy pursued by the European Union over the last couple of years. It was also very useful rhetorical tool for governments in Europe uh, to when, when uh, they were communicating uh, either with their own constituencies internally or with third governments outside Europe. Uh, so, but may, most, of, uh, most importantly, it was a very useful uh, incentive to encourage other countries to to cooperate closely and better on migration control outside of Europe. And what we finally found very interesting and important was that this approach actually brings a lot of risks with it. 
So, for example, when we use aid to block to stop one migration road, then alternative route, uh, route emerges. And uh, when we uh, uh, use financial incentives in relations with one government to cooperate with us on migration, then most likely another government will uh, be interested in using migration to extract, to blackmail you, to extract more financial resources or some political concessions from the European Union. And we observed this also, I, I believe, uh, at the Poland-Belarusian border recently. Then uh, we must be also aware that, that this kind of instrumentalization of aid uh, may bring some unintended negative consequences for, for fragile states uh, who are somehow uh, pushed to comply with uh, European interest on migration. And finally, uh, it brings some uh, questions about the impact on quality and productability of aid itself. So what are our basic recommendations for, for the future? I, I think we, we see a, a case for the linking of development and migration policies, because this, this very close uh, link uh, brings some unrealistic expectations and, and brings some risk that I uh, have just described. But uh, secondly, uh, we think there is need to link better the humanitarian and development assistance, especially uh, in, uh, in uh, protracted uh, refugee situations to, to build, uh, to provide some more durable uh, solutions to the countries that are hosting most of refugees worldwide. Thirdly, uh, we would rather encourage to continue humanitarian and development cooperation policies, but focus on the traditional goals that is fight with poverty and support economic growth, uh, the link from my good migration cons concerns. And this uh, development and humanitarian aid should be more focused and pay more attention to protracted crisis and uh, to support, to help to invisible refugees. Uh, fourthly, uh, we need that there is still unrealized potential of using aid uh, rather not to stop irregular migration, but to support and direct regular safe orderly migration. Uh, so we can better match the needs of the labor market in, uh, elsewhere in south, southern global south countries or in Europe. But also we need, we might spend more aid to mitigate and address unintended consequences of increased migration control in uh, countries surrounding Europe. And finally, if I, uh, there is also one recommendation specifically uh, ad uh, addressed uh, directed to Poland, uh, that we uh, certainly observed many, uh, many uh, reasons why Poland can learn from Norway, uh, both in terms of development cooperation policy, but also on migration policy. Norway is much more advanced and, and uh, experienced donor than Poland is, with more experience also in fragile states in, in the Middle East or in Africa. But also Norway went through this transition uh, from emigration country to immigration country and has more experiences in uh, integrating migrants internally. And uh, we can also learn from mistakes of Norway in this regard. So uh, I will stop here. Uh, more uh, observations and recommendations and, and detailed conclusions you can find in the report. But just to kickstart the discussion, I think this will be enough. Thanks, Patrick. I want to bring in uh, Morten uh, into the discussion, but I, I guess I want both of you to sort of reiterate once more the, the main finding, which I think might be counterintuitive, if not shocking, for, for a couple of our uh, viewers and listeners. So what you are saying is that as people get richer from the lowest point, so they are from the poorest, they get a bit richer. They are not 
prone to stay at home, they are more likely to migrate. Is that what you're saying? Shortly. No, just yes, no. I want to continue. The general answer, uh, Patricia, is yes. Okay. They, are, so, they are more likely, but it also depends on a number of other factors that uh, sure, sure. we so can, just can keep, get back to. Sure, so just keep it there. And so this uh, finding uh, can lead some of us to think that uh, actually aid is uh, useless in terms of uh, managing migration, uh, some may doubt the usefulness of humanitarian aid altogether. So I would I would like both of you to sort of separate development aid and say what that is from humanitarian aid and saying what that is. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I uh, if I may, Patricia, I mean, first, development aid was never established or constructed in order to tackle migration. Development aid was established to try to help poor countries to become slightly richer, slightly more uh, affluent, slightly more stable, having better institutions, better infrastructure, and so on and so forth. So it was never meant as a tool to tackle migration issues elsewhere in the world. Uh, secondly, development aid is not useless. I mean, in many places it works. And it do improves people's life. But if there are other conditions in these countries that makes people thinking that, okay, right now I have gotten it a little bit better economically, but do I trust that this will continue to be the case? Do I trust that uh, do I have enough trust in government, in institutions, in country of origin, so that I invest the, the, the surplus that I suddenly have? Do I invest that in my life here? Or... Do I think that this is not going to last very long? So uh, the, the most rational thing to do is, since I've gotten a little bit more money, is to try to leave this country. And this tipping point where this will start changing, I mean, this is something that the, the, the research literature has been searching for for, for, uh, for decades. And there is still a lot of uncertainty around where this tipping point is, because you may be able to sort of estimate it in purely economic terms, but for example, GDP per capita is a very sort of general indicator. It doesn't say anything really about trust, about institutions, about whether we are talking about inclusive or exclusive growth and so on and so forth. So there is a number of factors that think uh, that fits in there. But um, I would sort of be very strong on saying that development aid, if it works, it's not useless, but it's not. it was never meant to sort of uh, be a um, policy tool to tackle migration. It was meant for something. It's meant for something else. Uh, when it comes to the humanitarian assistance, and as Patrick alluded to, I mean uh, humanitarian assistance. It most of it works very well because it has one major objective, and that is to to alleviate massive suffering. It's to help people survive. And it do work. That's the goal of humanitarian assistance. But we also see, and several donors have now started to do this, even if work can be improved, when you have protracted refugee crises. If one is able to, uh, to both target poor IDPs or refugees, together with a similar focus on what is very often very poor host communities, this can, at least for, for a time being, reduce people's need to make even other secondary movements, either in the country of origin or towards other countries or attempting to, to reach Europe. So neither humanitarian assistance nor development assistance is useless. But that doesn't mean that these are, they were never meant to be policy tools to address migration, and we need to be aware of that. Uh, yeah, I'll stop there, and Patrick would probably like to come in as well. I already uh, mentioned in, in my presentation that there are also studies which uh, contradict and question this old uh, held knowledge about this casual relationship between development and migration, that 
more development will need lead to more migration. The, 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 there is at least one study from 2020 by Keele Institute, which shows that actually more migration uh, uh, can, uh, more development can decrease migration to uh, developing to Europe, to OECD countries. But this is kind of a new approach, new thinking, uh, which uh, uh, undermine uh, the all, uh, whole knowledge that we uh, have uh, had before. So I think this uh, uh, trait of research needs to be further elaborated and, and then probably we will learn more. But as Morton said, uh, economic growth or economic well-being is not the only thing that drives people uh, outside their homes and to, to seek better lives elsewhere. Uh, I think we need to uh, highlight also the technological changes, the, the globalization, that people are just more... Uh, uh, they they, they uh, can move around, move around the world also uh, easier. Uh, it's uh, less expensive today. So migration uh, depends on many different links, also the numbers of networks, social networks, diaspora in other countries, uh, political situation in, in developing country, etc. cetera. So uh, economic tool only, economic support to developing countries will not solve the, the, the all um, issues that makes people move. And, but, 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 you know, this is exactly this, this paradox or uh, this counterintuitive uh, statement uh, is very imp important. Uh, and this is one of the risks that we uh, found out uh, in our research. Then, then, then that if we tell people that, you know, development assistance will help to stop migration, and the people will learn after a while that this is not true, that most likely more development will lead to more migration, then, then, then we risk uh, decreasing support for development assistance. So that's why also uh, we are talking about the linking of migration concerns from development assistance. Humanitarian assistance is about saving lives. Uh, development cooperation is about, uh, about creating more stable international environment, supporting other, other countries to grow. They have the right to do so regardless of our migration interests. So we cannot instrumentalize development cooperation to such, a, such an extent that we uh, undermine the popular support for this kind of policy. And we uh, even instigate more fears about incoming migration from developing world. I would also add one more thing to this. There is also another very interesting paradox because we haven't mentioned uh, so far about the role of migrants or migration on developing countries. But if we look at the remittances sent from abroad by migrants who already reside, live in developed world, then these remittances uh, outnumber by far the, the size of development assistance or even foreign in, uh, direct investments that developing countries receive from the uh, North. So looking only from this developmental point of view, the more migration to developed world, the better for development of poor countries. Uh, migration is actually the best development assistance tool to, uh, to developing world. So it creates you no know, very strange paradox. If we use development assistance to support development uh, in developing countries, but at the same time to stop migration from that countries, uh, then this makes no sense, yeah? Because migration uh, can be more effective tool to support growth, economic growth and development than development assistance has ever been. So, uh, that's why we shouldn't uh, link too closely this migration interests with development assistance. 
Right, and with that, you've answered one of the questions that popped up here in, in, in our Zoom uh, about delinking development and migration policies. I mean, elaborating on that delink. So this is what you've both uh, done. And also you write indeed in your report. And so I uh, want to sort of uh, promote it uh, this way, that migration is the most effective development assistance as the remittances uh, the migrants sent back goes directly and without any interference costs to people in need. So this is a quotation from, from your report. Um, Morten, before, before I turn over to you, I wanted to ask you both to, because I think it might be interesting, to link uh, your um, field research. Morten, you've traveled uh, to Niger and the Lake Chad Basin. Patrick traveled to Bangladesh to talk about how uh, information that you gathered, gathered there uh, is connected with the results that you are now sharing. And also you write in the report, um, migration is an option inaccessible to most refugees. Uh, so please focus on this group refugees. And I guess this has a lot to do with Patrick's research in Bangladesh and, and tell us about migration of refugees and this linkage with assistance. Morten, you want to start? I don't know. Um, there is, I mean, the contemporary world of uh, both migration and refugee crises is, is full of paradoxes. And one place where you see this paradox in uh, very starkly is in the Lakshad Basin. Because these people who are on the run here, either as IDPs in their own countries or have again crossed the borders, for example, from uh, northern Nigeria into Niger or into Chad or into uh, northern Cameroon. These are people who has, uh, who has fled from the Boko Haram Iswap conflict, a deadly conflict that is ranging here. We hear about it every now and then. If there is any, I mean, you heard about the three book affair, which most of uh, people have heard about. Then it sort of disappeared off the screen. And every now and then there is a short notice on BBC about another couple of hundred people that has been killed uh, somewhere in, in areas that a few of us know where are and so on and so forth. These people are the invisible refugees of the world. They are invisible because they are stuck there. The, the, the people fleeing are some, uh, come from some of the poorest communities in the world, and they are now being hosted by commun local host communities that are equally poor. And in many ways, we could say that they have become invisible because the overall majority of them have absolutely no chances of even thinking about traveling, uh, getting to Europe. And in that way, they become invisible. They are only visible through every now and then some humanitarian uh, action and so on and so forth. And this is of course a, a paradox because these are among the world's absolutely most vulnerable refugees. And they survive basically on, uh, by, living, by being hosted in poor, in poor communities and by very underfinanced international humanitarian responses. Then on the other hand, if you then move from the Lakshad Basin to another part of uh, Niger where we have also worked, that is the uh, Agadez, which is the, in many ways for several years has been the, one of the transit migration capitals of Africa. There is, there, what we find there is an enormously strong focus by the European Union and also other European uh, bilateral donors on refugees and, per and particularly on people seen as economic migrants. So those that reside, for example, in Diffa or other parts of the Lakshad Basin, very little focus on them because they lack both the resources and the networks in order to even attempt getting to Europe. But uh, what there is a huge focus on is but those... Can, can I chance. ask you, when you say focus, you mean economic focus? That is, there is no assistance reaching them? 
there is assistance re reaching them. But I mean, first, I mean, the humanitarian efforts here have been constantly underf uh, underfunded for the last 15 years, basically, by the international community. Uh, when we have these pledging conferences, there is a lot of money that is being pledged. But uh, when the Minister of Development Cooperation returns home to meet uh, his or her finance minister, uh, pledges tend to go down dramatically. So there are these, the humanitarian funds for these parts of the, of the world, for the Lakshad Basin, has been severely underfunded for the last 15 years, at least. Uh, when we turn, to, if you then turn the attention to Niger uh, and Agadez, there is an economic focus, but there is also a strong political focus on the various deal making that Patrick also alluded to between the European Union and, in this case, the government of, uh, of Niger, in order to try to, for the European Union to find different ways to convince the Nigerian government that uh, they should clamp down on the basically the migration business that has been going on in Agadez. And these refugees become, and migrants, the ones that reach here, becomes very visible for the European Union and European countries. And that is basically because they have a chance of reaching the Mediterranean, of reaching Europe. So these are some of the paradoxes here that some of the, the, of the, of the migrants and refugees that we see, that becomes very visible. And then you have the invisible ones that are the world's forgotten, the most marginal of the marginalized, so to speak. I just wanted to flag that because it says something about how short-term political interest from donors has sort of made its way into how we approach both two different crises, the crisis of irregular migration and the crisis and the refugee crisis. Yeah. Right. So when you say invisible, it means that they're not counted as part of the 26 million uh, or more than 50 million, depending on how you count uh, refugees listed by UNHCR. Well, they are counted, Patricia. They are counted. But I mean, there are different ways of being counted. You can be counted to be counted, and you be and you can be counted in a way that you matter. Mm -hmm. And these are simply just counted. But whereas the, these other groups, they are who has a chance of reaching Europe, they are counted in a way that matters mm -hmm. because right. they, they matter. Whereas these other ones, they, they simply don't matter in this large sort of accounting of uh, of the world's refugees. Okay. okay. Can, so in that sense, uh, yeah. So in that sense, the Rohingya. I mean, if I can uh, say it that way, although it's not very elegant, they're more fortunate because the world has heard about them, Patrick. Yes, in general, so far so good. But uh, they are risking the, the same fate, like like mm -hmm. uh, refugees in Lake Chad Basin, to become invisible refugees. The most recent uh, re uh, appeals for humanitarian assistance for re Rohingya were funded in uh, several per percentage points lower than previous appeals. So the funding coming to Bangladesh is decreasing. And this, uh, as the, the crisis become protracted, then there is less and less attention from the world to this crisis and more and more burden being laid on the Bangladeshi government to deal with this situation. And this is exactly the, the, the problem that Orton has described. And if I may add to this, uh, uh, what Morton said uh, regarding invisible refugees and inequalities in support for refugee situations worldwide, we see these correlations that the farther you are from the Europe, Europe, the less likely you are as a refugee to be supported by international and Western uh, donors. Uh, this is also visible in the statistical data of uh, development assistance and humanitarian uh, assistance going to refugee uh, refugees worldwide, which shows that almost 50%, almost half of the whole money supporting refugees worldwide uh, is going to one region. This is Middle East because it's so close to, to uh, European Union and, and it, get, 
can get this attention and we have visible refugees who got not only attention but also got very concrete financial support and the other support and if you are stuck in southern africa or maybe in, in uh, southern uh, america or in some distant region in asia then you you are less likely not only to move to developed world but also that you will be uh, attended and, and supported by the by the world and uh, coming back to my experiences uh, from from bangladesh this was quite a positive and very interesting experience uh, because it uh, it went against this kind of uh, very popular critique of international development uh, industry uh, that maybe this is useless you, you know it's too 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 late to too little etc there are there are many problems with this and, and maybe we should not support, uh, spend money for development assistance or humanitarian assistance. And to my understanding, the situation in the camps in, in Bangladesh was very positive in the sense that really it was thanks to international community that the needs uh, and, and of refugees has been taken care of. The, the appeals for the support of Rohingya were uh, regularly funded in over 70%, which is relatively high on, on global standards. Uh, the, Re the Rohingya refugees had uh, access to free healthcare, to shelters, to a kind of education and, and, and so on. There was a lot of coordination between different uh, international and regional organizations supporting Rohingya. There was kind of good cooperation with the government of Bangladesh, uh, but, but, but uh, and, and most importantly, uh, the principles of global refugee compact was implemented in Bangladesh to a large extent. This means that not only the international community supported refugees in the camps, but also the host communities. Some kind of one third of all international assistance to Rohingyas were directed to local Bangladeshi people who uh, might otherwise uh, have felt uh, treated unfairly and uh, marginalized on its own land. So this is very important and very uh, good example of uh, support from the international community, but it shows only that uh, if you have no one crucial ingredient, then you cannot solve the protracted refugee crisis. And this crucial element is support and cooperation <coughs> from the hosting government. <coughs> it means that uh, even uh, with its uh, financial power, the international community could not force and or push or encourage or incentivize government of Bangladesh <clears throat> to give more rights to refugees, huh? to let them work outside the camps, uh, to, to integrate them into the local market, to let them go to local schools, etc. This is this was and still is a no-gone uh, area for the Bangladesh government, and it shows that. Without, again, without a political solution to this uh, crisis of Rohingya refugees, uh, there will be no durable solution to the fate uh, and to, to the problem of Rohingya. Uh, Morten, you wanted to jump in here? Yeah, just very quickly, I'll just to reiterate what uh, Patrick already said, because I think this is an important uh, sort of, uh, not necessarily the original finding, but I mean, uh, that we have fleshed out uh, in uh, some detail uh, in, in the project, and that is that, yes, I mean, a good combination of targeted humanitarian assistance and development assistance can that sort of circles in on both refugees, host populations, and the national government can alleviate and help in a protracted crisis situation as the one that we find uh, among the Rohingya and so on and so forth. But mm -hmm. we should equally have to understand that any attempt at trying to sort of squeeze blackmail or whatever we would like to call it to get a country like Bangladesh or any other of these countries to accept that this will last forever that they will just become the dumping ground for people that we don't want to see move any further 
that will backfire. It is not simply not going to work, which means that, yes, as long as the protected crisis remains, that uh, the, the, the support to these kind of countries like Bangladesh, that houses the Rohingya, but also others, needs to remain relatively high. While we, can, while we simultaneously, the international community needs to try to work politically to solve the root causes of the situation. And that is, in this case, the political situation in Myanmar. So again, I mean, also with regard to protracted uh, refugee crises, we need to realize that, yes, development assistance, humanitarian assistance can alleviate for a, for a time being. But it was never meant as tools to show, to, to see difficult and complex political issues that are underneath there. For that, you need other tools than development assistance. Right. Uh, so this is what I wanted to ask, because Patrick talked about the usefulness and effectiveness of assistance in uh, Bangladesh. But then if you link it to migration, there is not a direct linkage, right? This is what Morten is saying. I mean, you help in order to address the root cause of a conflict and of a dire situation. And only by doing that, do you have an impact on migrating patterns? And then also what is interesting is whether there's any difference between irregular and regular migration. I mean, well, because you, Patrick, you, you did not speak about migration. Uh, I understand that, uh, I mean, Rohingya, they just moved from Myanmar to, to Bangladesh, and this is the migra migratory aspect. But how much are these people prone to migrating further away or actually going back? I mean, if there are possibilities and, and the conflict is alleviated. So I'm just more curious about this migratory aspect to, 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 to the situation in Bangladesh. But the case of Rohingya is very <laughs> particular because there are no conditions for them to migrate anywhere. Yeah? This is the largest stateless group in the world. They have no passports, they have no any refugee card, whatever. They have no title to move uh, legally abroad. And they are surrounded, uh, they are, first of all, they are kept in the camps, uh, fenced camps, so they cannot even move freely uh, around Bangladesh, even though this happened uh, to some extent illegally. But then uh, they are surrounded by not very friendly uh, neighborhood. Yeah? They cannot go escape to India because India is doing pushbacks and, and not, does not accepting any refugees. They cannot go, go back to Myanmar because they, they just escaped from the persecution and death from the, and the situation hasn't improved uh, anyhow. So the only way for them to emigrate is to migrate to uh, ASEAN countries through very dangerous sea routes uh, in the uh, Arabian Sea. So, uh, so this is an option that some kind of one to 2,000 Rohingyas are trying to undertake every, every year with many deaths on the sea. But this is uh, available only for the most affluent and more courageous, maybe, uh, of Rohingya refugees. Most of them are stuck. Yeah? Some of them are trying to get some fake documents and can travel uh, around. But what uh, interested me in this uh, case was whether we have some kind of situation. If the problem with Rohingya refugees is not taken care of, if the world is not supporting Bangladesh in dealing with the situations, then it, it has the refugee crisis can have a negative impact on the local population in Bangladesh. Now it can lead, and we observed this recently, it can lead to tensions between the host community and refugees. Uh, there is deteriorating security situation, there are competition over resources and everything. Yeah? So the question is whether this kind of uh, refugee crisis, if not taken care of, can push local Bangladeshi people to emigrate because they, they see no future in their own uh, land. And this uh, even, this relation, uh, relationship, I haven't noticed in, in Bangladesh. 
because okay. probably also because this group is relatively small. Yeah, we'll, we talk about less than 1 million refugees in a country that has 160 million population. So, so it has not big impact on Bangladesh also because of the relatively small. Right. So let's let's move away from uh, Bangladesh and, and uh, Lake Chad Basin and Niger uh, for the last 10 minutes that we have. We have one question uh, coming in from Grzegorz Bruca. We will, I hope we'll be able to um, hear him ask this question. Mr. Gruca? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, congratulations for the for the research. I think it's it's very useful because we tend to ask questions, and uh, at least now we have some answers. Um, I would like to uh, just ask uh, whether you took into consideration the migration flow that will become quite uh, big uh, due to the um, climate changes. Because, of course, we can take many uh, issues into consideration. Also, mm, you mentioned economical, psychological, um, but this might become imminent and we'll be just, uh, we'll be facing situation where people will be um, trying to get to Europe in order not to starve uh, in their countries. And I think this is uh, something that, uh, still uh, development assistance can do something about as, as we are speaking about um, linking uh, humanitarian and development assistance towards uh, projects that can uh, make the countries and people living in the countries more resilient to the to the climate changes we, we have a great project in Kenya we are building uh, them uh, dams send dams for the uh, local, uh, together with a local partner, with the local population, where they can harvest, it. yeah, where yeah. they can, uh, where they can uh, harvest uh, water uh, during the, the rainy season. But even then, the same, the, the seasons are changing now. And in South Sudan, we have situation where we have the uh, drought and uh, and flood at the same time. So uh, I wonder if this is a new factor that can really. Um, well, change our our, our uh, perception of migration. Because yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. We we got your question. We have very little time, so that's why I just need to cut you short. Thanks okay. for asking that. Thank it's, you. It's very important. Uh, Morton, can you address this? Yes, and I mean, uh, this is there is a perfect storm brewing, unfortunately, in uh, parts of the of Africa that is not too far away from the Mediterranean shores, and that is uh, in the Sahel area. Where, and here you find some of the world's most fragile states, states that sort of, if they compete about something, it's about who is at the bottom of the human development index. Countries like Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, Central African Republic, and now should add to this situation with the war in Ethiopia and South Sudan on this list as well. These, these countries, maybe with the uh, Ethiopia part that has some industries. I mean, country like Mali and Niger has, their, con their contribution to global CO2 emissions is minimal. But these are the countries that will have, where you will see the worst effects of this. A global temperature, the increase of two to four degrees towards 2040 will have dramatic effects in the Sahel. And then if you add in that these are uh, among the um, populations in the world that grows the fastest, each woman in Niger gives birth to 7.23 children. I mean, you have a perfect storm brewing here. Yes, development assistance can mitigate some of this, but then we need something in this area that we simply do not have now, and that is political stability, peace and reconciliation. So there is still a window of opportunity for the international community to act here through concerted development assistance, peace assistance, humanitarian assistance. But we better hurry up because this window is, uh, is about to close soon and we may, may have a situation that none of us really would like to think about. And that is massive uh, movements of people out of the Sahel, some trying to move northwards towards uh, Europe, but also a lot, a lot of poor people being pushed further south into 
the what we call the tropical forest belt of Africa, where these effects will be at least slightly smaller, and the massive conflicts that this could give rise to. So yes, this is something that we need to be extremely concerned about. We need to increase our research into these areas and into these questions, and we need to make uh, to continue to work to make policymakers aware of the situation that is being faced there. And we need to think about the issue of how to make uh, climate and climate refugees also are uh, legal terms in the uh, in international humanitarian law, I believe. Right, though there's um, strong resistance at the UN. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a very uh, important question about climate change, but have you addressed this in your writings throughout the, the, the project uh, at all, Morten? <laughs> We have mentioned it and we are aware of it. Uh, the, the problem is, of course, uh, researching something that is about to happen. Uh, we can point to the dangers there, and we have done that. But I mean, we, there is no, uh, for the time being, I mean, yes, we see that the, the seasonal migration in some of these countries, the transhumans is going further south and so on. We know that it leads to conflict. But we don't have the trend data that uh, uh, makes it possible to say that this is how this will be, because we are talking about the uncertainty of the future, basically. Right. Um, so we have four minutes left. Uh, I wanted to ask you both to, I mean, summarize if you want to, but also to focus maybe on the recommendations in the future. Patrick, you had that in your slides, but also what Europe has done right, what it has not done so right or wrong, outright wrong. And uh, what, if, you, if you see a, a way in uh, amending or reforming uh, development assistance so that there's more regular migration, less irregular migration, and so that the conflicts are mitigated and propagated. Patrick, can we start with you? I think basically that Europe has done uh, right and, and, and good uh, as so far. We have noticed um, some risks for the future and some, some uh, unintended consequences of the current approach. Uh, so we warned uh, against them, about them, uh, but uh, there are some, some gaps also in this uh, approach. Like we haven't so much talked about this legal migration and this, this Field hasn't improved too much over the last couple of years. And I think development assistance can be more useful in this regard to, to help, for example, train people in developing countries to match the needs of the labor market in the neighborhood, in South, global south, or maybe in developed north. So I, I see a lot of potential for improvements in this policy. Also, I'm afraid that probably uh, when we externalize uh, migration management to, our, to third countries, there is less pre pressure put on ourselves to reform our own uh, migration and asylum policy, to put our own house in order. Uh, so I, I think we shouldn't rely to such an extent or third countries or external partners, but we have a lot of work to do, uh, homework to do, in Europe in, in terms of, of putting right policies and mechanism uh, in, in, uh, in, in, in order. Uh, so I think that there is uh, room for uh, improvement, uh, but uh, it, it, it needs also to continue development cooperation and, and humanitarian assistance. And maybe we shouldn't instrumentalize this so much, but continue to do this because it has a lot of very important uh, things to, to achieve in developing world. And it, ha it has been stabilize stabilizing uh, refugee situations and, and uh, poor countries around Europe. So it, it brings a lot of positive uh, results to, to Europe and to developing countries, but we, we must be aware of the shortcomings and, and risks uh, attached to the, that kind of approach. Thanks. Morten, any thoughts from your side also about the project since it's the last seminar that we're having in the framework? Um, I think I would like to end by saying that the European 
countries together are among the world's most advanced donors. And European countries have become quite good at giving development assistance. But of course, we are, quite, we are best at doing it in the more advanced developed countries. The challenge now is how to deal with the most fragile of us. And there, the European countries together needs to learn how to do this better. Development assistance has worked. It has provided for a more stable world. It continues to at least avoid a complete breakdown in places like Mali and Niger and parts of the Sahel. That's important. It's important for the people who live there, but it's also important for, for Europe. But development assistance can never save a country. It can never build a new state or build a new economy. It was never set up to do that. It was never meant to do this. It was meant as assistance, and we need to remember that. So the European countries should continue to do what they're good at, and that's giving good development assistance. But what Europe should be very careful in doing is to try to use development assistance as a policy tool to reach other types of goals, including refugee and migration management. Why is that the case? It's the case because not only could it easily backfire, but it could also have a lot of unintended consequences. And we have to keep in mind, as the situation of the Agadez in Niger reminds us, is that European donors lack the context sensitivity to understand often fine-grained local political compromises. And we, need to, we should be very careful with messing with things that we really often do not understand very well. That, that is not to say that we should allow a place like Agadez to continue to be the transit migration capital of the world with perhaps as many as 250,000 refugees and migrants passing through it. It just, it just shows that we need to also to become better at understanding the contextual political logic of how fragile states actually operate. Because they do operate, but they do operate in a slightly different fashion and manner than all states do. Here, I think there is room for a whole lot of improvement, but neither humanitarian assistance nor development assistance is useless. It provides for a more stable world, and without it, we would have seen even more protracted refugee crises and more economic migrants. Thank you. So sounds like the best conclusion ever, but Patrick raised his hand, so I don't know. Just a sentence <laughs> from you before I close. Just uh, one last sentence. Uh, I, I think uh, the, the approach of addressing root causes of migration was also good in this regard, that we believe there is an economic solution to the problem of migration, of irregular migration. <clears throat> so, and it was uh, partly successful, partly not. You but have two now, sentences to say. <laughs> but now I'm afraid that we are <clears throat> turning to the wrong direction <clears throat> of securitization of, of, of uh, migration policy. Uh, we are becoming more close to migration of all sorts. And, and then I would prefer rather to to continue this economization of migration policy rather than securitization of, of the migration policy. And in this regard, development assistance is still needed. Right, thanks. Okay, securitization, we haven't touched on that, uh, even though it's a topic that's been there in the debates uh, very uh, vividly in the past uh, couple of months. Um, I want to congratulate both of you and, and your teams uh, that worked on the project um, and refer our viewers and, and listeners to the report that will soon be online uh, on our PISM website, uh, Development Assistance and Root Causes of Migration, a Rescue Road to Unsustainable Solutions. I like the title precisely because it says it all. Um, so thanks so much. Uh, I, I guess you only touched on one aspect of uh, migration and development. There's much more to it. And actually, there's just one aspect of the debate about migration anyway. There are so many. So I think, uh, and also hope that it, this is just one in a series of 
seminars and, and conversations that we'll be having uh, soon in the future. Morten Boas, Patrick Kugel, thank you very much and thanks to our viewers. Uh, we invite you to our future seminars and please check out the Midasha project and everything that's been written within that framework. It's online on the NUPI and PISM website. Thanks. Thank you.